Hello, and welcome to Rome 2, Episode 7, Economic Growth. So last time we left off with needing to pick a new technology. We completed land management a few turns ago, and then just this past turn we completed iron tools. So we're looking at completing either double cropping or common weights and measures. And I believe we're going to go with common weights and measures. So what are common weights and measures? How much is a handful of grain or of olives? Whose hand is used? Exactly. Plus 2% wealth from all commerce, all regions. Plus 2% tariff income from trade agreements and enables the building of the warhorse breeder, the trader, the wine trader, and the amphora kiln. So that'll be a nice little boost to our economy there. As the name of the episode suggests, we are going to be focusing on economic growth. It's also going to take us five turns to research common weights and measures, whereas iron tools and land management had only taken three turns. So you see these techs are starting to take a little bit longer because they're not the base tech anymore. So a little bit more about common weights and measures. The science of measurement, metrology, was invented by the Egyptians during the Bronze Age. Its creation was inspired by a lust for money as Pharaoh Sesostris wanted to measure and tax his subjects' arable land. Units of measurement were typically based on parts of the human body or a man's capacity. The digit, palm, foot, and pace, for example. Not surprisingly, there were many local variations, but as trade between cities and states increased, there were attempts to introduce standard quantities of everything. The Greek king Phaedon is widely recognized as the creator of the first set of agreed common weights and measures. So obviously in 2023, we don't think about this too much, right? When you're weighing stuff, you can weigh it by tonnage. It's pretty fair. Every scale hopefully works the same. But they didn't really have a weighing system just yet. So they were working on it, right? Or they, you know, measured by the handful, but people had different sized hands. Or, you know, they measured by a foot in this region, and the foot in this region was larger than feet in another region. So getting everyone on board, you know, that was important. And it led to economic growth for all parties involved. So that is our technology. We also did not spend our money from last turn. So we have 6,148 denarii in the treasury. And we are going to use it on the slave trader. I knew that the technology was going to be completed. Iron tools that allowed us to build the slave trader. So that is why we saved. So the slave trader. Slaves are the sinews of an empire. Nothing can be achieved without them. Minus 3% construction costs. 75 wealth from the local commerce. Plus 3 banditry in the local province. Plus 2% recruitment costs for pre-Marian heavy infantry. Plus 25% wealth generated by slaves. Reduces a slave population decline. Plus 5% wealth from industry. Minus 2 slave unrest. The sell slaves edict. Minus 10% slave population. And the commercial stimulation edict. Plus 5% slave population plus 0.3% third-class citizens. It will take six turns to complete, and it will cost us 5,069 denarii. So let's read a little bit about the slave trader. At the height of the Roman Empire, slaves were a quarter of Italy's six million population. So just let that set in. At the height of the empire, a quarter of the population of slaves. That's, that's, that's incredible quarter of six million people with slaves. We can round up to just a third and say that two million people were slaves. Two million people. It's a lot of people. In Rome, every third person was a slave. There you go. The slave trade was essential to Roman society as human muscle power did everything from quarrying and mining to farming and building. We touched upon that last episode. Slavery was a huge business and criminals Prisoners of wars and those simply abducted from their homelands were sold for their labor. Once enslaved, the unlucky individual had no rights under Roman rule. The biggest market was the Greco Stadium in Rome, originally specializing in the trade of Greek prisoners. Domestic servants, field hands, quarrymen, gladiators, and harlots were all traded flesh from as far afield as Britain, Parthia, Carthage, and Egypt. In fact, such exotic origins meant a premium price. So we touched upon a little bit of this, right? They described the types of slaves. The slaves I did leave out, right? They were much, I don't want to say less popular, but gladiators were slaves, right? You would take those that were likely prisoners of war and that had a fighting ability and train them, and then they would 
fight for the plebs and the patricians spectacle. There were also, as always, harlots, right? Uh, sex slaves was just a thing. It happens, I don't want to say everywhere, but it's just, it's part of society. You don't have to like it. You don't have to love it. It's just going to be there. It's how humanity is. And then, like they said, as the empire grew, peoples that were from Britain, Parthia, Carthage, and Egypt, right, that were far away, when they got imported to Latium, right, or Italia, they were different, right? They had different either hair colors, they had different skin tones, they had different builds. You know, this isn't, just, just think for a minute, this isn't 2023. You don't have videos and you don't have pictures. So a pleb that spends his entire life in Rome or an entire life in a town in Italia will never ever see a Britannian, a Parthian, a Carthaginian, or Egyptian unless they're brought to Italy. So there you have it. And for those debauched people that had money, they would often buy these people and do with them what they wanted. So we're going to go ahead and build that. Once again, it's mainly for that huge economic benefit we get. Uh, commercial stimulation edict will now generate slaves instead of slowly losing slaves. If you look at the slave population in Latium now, it is at 17.2%. But after the capture of Aretium, it was somewhere near about 20%. So the slave population slowly declines. That leaves us only 1,079 denarii in the treasury. We have a 3,726 move next turn. And we currently have 15 food. So that is about all I wanted to cover. We're going to go ahead and end the turn. And see what the next turn brings us. So farewell. Turn 7, summer of 277 BCE. I'm excited to see if there's anyone else that we can trade with. Like I said, we had a diplomatic flurry last turn. And I went very quickly. I listened to it and I'm like, wow, that was fast. So we're going to probably do a quick diplomatic overview next turn and then see what's happening around us. A lot of people are at war. You know, a lot of these little tribes or little factions that have like one city will eat up another city. So they'll have two and there'll be a bunch of people with two and then they'll go at war and they'll have three or four. And eventually in the mid game, you'll get other like quote unquote actual civilizations right now you're just dealing with basically city-states across the map all right welcome to fall of 277 bce our hidden agent has been exposed ulpia severa which is okay so the first thing we're going to do and this is the first thing i like to do for most turns i'm going to try to keep this format the same as i'm going to introduce the year and the turn and then we're gonna go s deal with any of our event messages that popped up and then once that's dealt with we're gonna go find our spy wherever she left off and i have no idea where even left her off all the way up here in where is this palendava right where the daisy are really far north and we're gonna just move her so we have a couple areas of the map unexplored here we have basically the peloponnese right where sparta is down there thessaloniki that's the area between what's going to be Athens and Macedon. Then we have Macedon up here to the north in the mountains. So we're just going to take Opia Severa and we're going to have her follow this road and move her into this territory that we can't see right here. See if we run into anybody. And we did. All right. So we ran into, we Can talked about them last time a little bit, the Tolis de Bogi. So we'll open up some diplomatic relations with them real quick and see what they have to say for themselves they do not like me because i do believe i made a treaty with their enemies which i did and we can't trade with them anyway so we don't care we're just going to ignore them we'll open up our diplomatic overview real quick just to give those that can see a view the rest of us will go through it so Carthage, Athens, Basilian, Odrison, Bithynia, Deorsi, 
Feeney and Venetia are all friendly with me. They were all also trading with me. Then the Apulai, the Ardii, the Daisi, the Arvasi, the Gaiti, the Abatides, the Ligurians, Lydia, Massalia, Nori, Pergamon, Scordisi, Sparta, Syracuse, and the Tolstobogai are all neutral. I'm trading with a few of them. We're actually going to contact Lydia real quick and see if we can get that trade agreement to go through. It failed last time. If I can give you a fair it's answer, fail this time you too. will have it. You would not. Oh, we tried. Pull that map back up. Sort by friendliness. And then lastly, we have a few factions that utterly hate us. The Dalmatii, the Coinenton Italone, Tribali, Apyros, and the Insubres. There has been no war declared this turn. Check our northern borders. It looks like Massalia has one army in their city and they're mustering another one. Genoa has a second army they're now mustering, but their main army is gone. They also have a fleet. They don't have eyes on the Insubre, so I don't know what's going on there. I don't know what happened to Venetia, but they have two separate armies of about 10 and 13 units. And that's about all I have vision on. Everywhere else is fog of war, so we're just gonna we'll go back to doing our thing. So we moved our spy. I don't think we can have her establish an intelligence network. Oh, we can, so we'll put her into stance to have her do that. We'll check on our governors real quick, make sure that they're still administrating. All right, they are. Let's see what our event messages are. Construction report. We have completed... Wow, we completed upgrading the city of Rome. We completed the Roman village of Salt. We completed the Roman village of Fish. And we completed the Vinter. And boy, did that do some stuff to our economy. So, if you recall, at the end of last turn, we were making 3,726 denarii per turn. We are now making 6,266 just by completing those four very, very important buildings. So that is a huge, huge bump in money, which we could use. Fortunately, that bump will be next turn. So right now we only have 4,805 denarii to use in the bank. What do we want to upgrade? So I think we're going to stick with upgrading Latium. Because that's... I mean, Beneventum and Magna Gratia has stuff, but... We haven't touched our harbors yet. So that's what I'm going to touch. So right now, remember, the cities of Ariminum and Ascalum come with a port. So what is a port? A port is a gateway to the world of trade and military adventure. 45 wealth for maritime commerce, and it provides a garrison of some ships and uh, some recruitment ability. So it doesn't do much. So that can get upgraded into one of three things. It can go into a fishing port, go into a harbor, or it can go into a shipwright. The fishing port is going to be food focused, the harbor is going to be trading focused, and the shipwright is going to be military focused. So you can probably guess which one we're going to go into, right? Latium, commerce, you guessed it. We're going to go into the harbor. When ships can find safe haven, the people will prosper. 90 wealth from local commerce, 180 wealth from maritime commerce, plus 3 banditry in the local province, plus 15% piracy penalties in the local sea region, import food edict plus 2 food, import food edict plus 2 growth, the import food edict has a minus 8% local farming and livestock income, plus 0.3% foreigner population. So nothing crazy, but the biggest thing is we are generating more wealth from commerce. So what about the port? Well, any port needs a safe anchorage and a harbor where cargoes are manhandled onto ships. Greeks and Romans had different approaches. The Greeks adapted to the local environment, while the Romans tended to bend nature to their wills. This is clear in their harbor designs. As the Roman Empire grew, harbors had to be built as disembarkation points, sometimes in areas where there was no natural inlet, bay, or easy landing spot. 
In such cases, Roman engineers set out to remake the coastline, and they created artificial harbors for their ships. Using wood, concrete, and huge stone blocks, they built dams, piers, wharfs, seawalls, and even artificial islands to protect harbor. Trajan's extraordinary harbor at Centumbucale had a large basin dug into the shorelines of the river Tiber, all enclosed by huge walls. It was also connected by canal to Ostia further down the river. So, interesting. Now, I promise I don't play the game ahead, and I don't read any of these ahead, but we discussed that that town, I think it was called. So here it's called either Centumucale or Kentumucale. And that was, I think, the one that I talked about that was built on the northern side of the Tiber. Remember, because I said they built that large hexagonal harbor Trajan did? So, there you have it. It's like I can see into the future. Not really. But, what this means is, the Greeks, right, because of the Greek islands, they looked for natural inlets, natural harbors, natural, right? Just natural, All right, There's a good place, we have it here. But the Romans, they were much more, we're going to change the land, right? The way they built forts, the way they built roads, the way they built large, um, basically, lost for the word, areas where they produce food or produce olives, right? Olive trees, vineyards, any of the things, they changed the land a bunch. So the Romans would build these large harbors or these large ports where they needed to, often for military purpose when they needed, but if not military purpose, than commercial purpose. And then this whole harbor will eventually turn into a trading port. The harbor, you know, the port harbor trading port building only has the three levels. So that's all we're going to have to deal with. And we're going to go ahead and build that. So the harbor will cost us 3,335 denarii and will take us six turns to complete. And that will just about strap us of cash for this turn. We are down to 1,470 denarii in the treasury. But remember, we are going to have a 6,266 gain next turn. We are going to have 12 food. So we lost a little bit of food. And we are going to head on to winter. We do have two more event messages. Nothing crazy. So it looks like... The governor Decim Decimus Claudius Nepos gained the trait refined. A good grasp of local culture can be useful, plus two cultural influence. So Decimus Claudius Nepo is hanging out in Magna Gratia, and he gained that extra cultural boost, so that's going to help us convert that faster. Latium also has an early autumn, so that's harming us. But despite the early autumn modifier... Latium is now at negative 57 public order with a plus 3 move next turn. So we're going to be trending positive. Magna Gratia is at negative 40 with only a minus 1 next turn. So slowly, slowly we're getting there. Latium is also 58% Latin with a 0.4% move next turn. Italic is faulting, faulting, falling and Celtic is still rising. And then over in Magna Gratia, we are 21% Latin with a 2.5% move next turn. Hellenic and Italic are both at about 39%. So we're getting there. It is a little bit worrisome being on turn 8 and the fact that I'm still not building up my military. But like I said, I think a long time ago, we want to get that per turn mark up to about 10,000 before, uh, before we do anything crazy. So... Farewell, turn 8, fall of 2000, yeah, 2000, 277 BCE, let's head into the next turn. Bound right. by treaty, our lands would be as trireme and sail, indivisible, strong, Powerful. What say you? So Sparta has approached me. They are demanding 100 denarii and they want a non-aggression pact. I'm just going to go ahead and accept this. Greece is pretty low on my... Apollo, smile on you for this acceptance. You are an ornament to your city, land, people. Hear that? I'm an ornament. Maybe I'm a Christmas ornament. Anyways, Greece is pretty low on my to-do list, right? To-conquer list. 
remember, we only get so many legions. Right now we have four. At Imperium, the next Imperium level will only get six. And after that, I don't even remember. No idea. So with six legions, that's a lot of that's a lot to cover, right? You can't. I don't want to say you can't, but you still have to keep an, a legion, you know, in Italy, right? Just in case. And if Carthage does go to war with us, we're gonna need like all five legions to deal with Carthage, right? Because Carthage is just that massive. So why not? I'm not gonna be going to Greece anytime soon. We have a non-aggression pact. See what happens. All right. Let's see. We got some some stuff happening. So first of all, welcome. It is turn nine. Winter, two hundred and seventy-six BCE. So we're gonna have a cute little this year in history later. But for now, what you need to know is trade agreement dissolved with Liguria. Trade with this valued ally is no longer possible. Our hidden agent has been exposed, Ulpia Sevra. She's also gained a rank. The Senate has issued a mission. Well, I pretend it's the Senate. I don't know who issues this minute. We're going to say it's the Senate. The Senate lauds your efforts to advance Rome's military potential, but feels that we would benefit from further development of military organization. Research a technology in the following category, tactics. We have five turns to complete it, and we will get more fervor for four turns. Your military endeavors are imbuing your troops with an unquenchable thirst for battle, plus 5% morale for all units. So we are going to sadly ignore that mission. 5% morale when I'm not at war with anybody isn't really anything to, to do anything about. So let's see what happened to the Ligurians. Oh no, the worst possible thing happened. The Insubres took them out. So faction destroyed. The Trabali. This faction has been destroyed. The people scattered to the winds. So the Trabali. They were just south of the Scordisi, right below the Danube in the interior. They are no longer there anymore. Now, the Ligurians are technically still around. I'm seeing a fleet off the coast of Massalia. I can't actually see it because of the fog of war. But when I opened up the diplo diplomatic screen, I could see them there. So, Liguria is technically not destroyed, but the Insubres have a 20 stack and an 8 stack there. And that is not good, because that now puts the Insubres on my doorstep and the Insubres do not like me because of my treaties with the Venetia, my cultural version, and my past treaties with the Ligurians. So that is very bad. Very, very bad. So that means I might actually have to start recruiting an army now on turn 9 instead of like turn 15 because they could march right into Aretium if they wanted to. Although this does present an opportunity to raid territory, which we could talk about. It also doesn't look like the Venetians are faring very well either. At least with the Insubres, I'm half their power right now, so that I'm betting that 20 stack is severely damaged. It does suck that my spy is out spying elsewhere, but we'll come back to that. We'll let that ruminate for a bit. So a faction rises. The Isatice. No idea. Another faction rises. The Ossetani. No idea. I have a couple household expands. Lucius Papyrus Cursor, the general, has got a master of horse. Horses have wisdom if you know how to use it. Plus 4% morale for all cavalry units. Plus 5% experience gain rate for cavalry units. We have another one. The governor, Marcus Caecilius Scorus, has gotten a Latin Pangerist. It's always nice to be told you're perfect. Plus 1 authority, which we'll keep for him. It is nice to always be told you're perfect, isn't it? Let's head over to Ulpia Severa. We're going to go ahead and move her first. 
So I still want to head down into Greece. At least get some vision on Sparta. Like, I know the city's down there, right? But I can't see it. So we're gonna... We're gonna go this way, actually. We'll head up to where the Trabali used to be. Let's see if we can't see where their city used to be. Trading. See who actually conquered it. Okay, so there it is. The city of Nysos In service, was captured to... by the Basilian Odrison. So that is now two cities that the Basilian Odrison have. So looking at our diplomacy out here, we definitely want to keep the Basilian Odrison happy because they have two cities. How can I be of assistance? Now, we can rank her up. So we'll go through her stuff I don't think we have before. Opia Severa, she's 19. So remember, because she's not staying deployed, I'm only deploying her to establish an intelligence network every other turn. She's not gaining experience as quickly. So she's an academic. Education and upbringing are the foundations of character, plus 10% military research rate faction-wide. She's a narcissist, indulgent, vain, and selfish, plus 3% research rate while deployed in enemy territory. That's zeal-based. 100 wealth gained after successfully robbing an enemy agent, that's cunning based, minus 9% chance to kill the target during an assassination, minus 20% chance of evading enemy agents, and plus 3% chance of success of enemy agent actions, cunning based. So, nothing that really matters. I guess the research rate helps, but not really. So, what is her skill? Well, she's a brothel worker. It's surprising what you can learn when you're staring at the ceiling. That is quite risque. Plus 2% chance of success in actions against enemy agents and generals. Plus 5% cost of performing all actions. Plus 2 public order in the local province. Interesting what some of these, uh, some of these tabs say. Alright, so we're going to go ahead and just give her the base traits of agent and spy. Agent is all men have a weakness. It just needs to be exposed, plus one authority, and plus five percent chance of critical success in all missions. And then spy. Watching is a skill that all men have, but few appreciate. Plus one cunning, and plus five percent chance of evading enemy agents. Because she doesn't do a whole lot of actions, and the bonuses aren't going to really help, we just build up her traits so that she has, hopefully, some authority, cunning, and zeal to protect her against agent actions. Yeah, right now, she does have three authority, four cunning, and and two zeal so the authority is neutral the cunning does give us plus two line of sight and the zeal hurts us because it is under average i'm gonna go ahead and check on our governors just to make sure they are still both administering so we are good now i need to see we have to recruit some units Fourteen fifty versus thirteen thirty four. So it's cheaper for Lucius Julius Libo to recruit units. Man, I really do not want to recruit units, but I do not have a choice. This is really gonna slow me down. But I cannot risk that army taking a retium. That will basically ruin the game. So we're going to cancel the Bread and Games and Latium. It's going to hurt a little bit. But I want to go into full commercial mode. So we're going to go with commercial stimulation. That's to plus 16% wealth from all commerce buildings, minus 2 public order from luxuries, plus 20% slave population over time, and plus 5 to the slave unrest. Hopefully that doesn't cause too much of a public order issue. I also realized we didn't get a chance to really uh, deck out our legions here, so let's find Legion 1. Ready for orders. Ready for battle. Okay, Legion 1 has the right standard, battle. has the eagle. Let's Come see about on. Legion 2. Legion 2, we give the... Where is it? Yep, the eagle inside of the wreath. Legion 3, we're going to change to the point or the spear inside of the wreath and Legion, that was Legion 4. So Legion 4 is going to be the hand inside of the wreath. You guys can't see this, but 
above each flag, you have an icon that signifies your legion. So, that's what we're doing. Now, we are going to move Legio 2 Ready for battle. as far north as possible without leaving the, pro or the region of Rome. Ready for so I don't want to draw manpower from Aretium, just in case I have to replenish my army because I get in a fight with the Insubres. I want to make sure that... The manpower is taken from Rome when I'm recruiting, because they have the large manpower reserve right now. At your command. Also going to take Legion 4, and just put those units into Legion 2. March. Return Legion 4 Hold to the city. Ready for battle. And then we'll start recruiting. So in an effort to save a little bit of money, let's plan out my army here. So I think we're going to go with... We have the one Roman general. We're going to have the four triarii. We're going to have the four equites. And the rest are going to be principes. So if we do some quick math, four plus four is eight, plus one is nine. That will leave us with 11 open slots. That means we're going to have 11 Principes. So currently we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Let's recruit 6, Rome 7, 8. Fighters. So we're only going to recruit 3 units. Now I think if we do get attacked next turn, we'll be in okay shape. Because those... That army is damaged. Like I said, we went to the diplomacy screen and we checked out the balance of power, and right now it's even. Although we do have your command. Command four out. units of Principes in the south patrolling still, so I don't know. It's a risk we'll have to take. It's balancing, right? We've got to balance now because I want to still build a new building every turn, just so we still have that economic growth, right? We're not going to get two buildings a turn like I wanted. It is what it is. Sacrifices must be made, I guess. So we're going to go ahead and build another harbor. We did the first harbor in Ariminum. And we're going to do the second harbor in Ascalum. Probably should have built the first harbor in Ascalum because it makes more per turn than Ariminum, but it is what it is. We do have 1,529 denarii left over. I'm not going to build another Principes. We're just going to hold for now. So, because it is winter, our income did drop pretty low. We dropped to 5,662 denarii per turn. I wouldn't say that's low per se, but that's a right about a 600 drop from turn 8. But we're in winter, so we have that nasty winter modifier. The good news is between spring next turn and the drop of breading games to commercial stimulation we should be in good shape we also did encounter a faction all right so we did encounter the antigone and i who as you might know do not like me mainly because of my treaties with apyros and athens so they are unfriendly and they are at a value of negative 36 they are Hellenic and aggressive and reliable. I never did the Tulsta Bow guy, did I? They're neutral, right? Negative 12. Celtic and aggressive and reliable. But because they didn't have a port, I didn't care. We're going to see if we can we trade are not with them. We known as patient people. Therefore, welcome. Speak to the point. Yeah, that got rejected pretty easily. Your deceitful merchants can stay out of our lands and markets. Yeah, that's to be expected. So let's see, who's stronger? Technically, wow, technically it says Athens is stronger. Just a little bit, not by much. But once again, without vision, I don't really know what's going on there. So the Antigone die, right, that's Macedon, are at war with Athens and the Tolstobogai. 
Maybe that'll help, maybe not. We'll see. Like I said, the entire Greek, Thessaloniki, Math Macedon, Illyrian coast is a disaster. And now even Cisopania is a disaster, but we're going to make do with the best we have. I might recruit another Princapes. So the upkeep for Princapes right now are 171 denarii per turn. So with the three that we're recruiting, right, we can round up to 200 and then take away 30, like my quick math, or take away 90. So that's 600 minus 90, that's 510 we're going to get hurt next turn. We're going to go ahead and recruit that additional unit of Princapes, just in case I have to move out. So we're recruiting four units of Princapes. The treasury is down to 647. Let's have to cover this year in history, 276 BCE. The Roman Consuls and Greek Archontes. So I think this is Quintus Fabius Maximus Gurgis and C. Genusius Clepsina. I think that's Cornelius Genusius Clepsina. I'm not sure. The Athenian Archon is Philocrates. The Olympic victor in the stadium race is Idaeus of Kyrene. Births. Er Eratosthenes, the Greek mathematician, geographer, and astronomer. Gotta love those Greek names. In Egypt, the Egyptian king Ptolemy II's first wife, Arsinoe I, the daughter of the late king Lysimachus of Thrace, is accused, probably at instigation of Ptolemy II's sister, who also has the name Arsinoe, of plotting his murder and is exiled by the king. Arsinoe then marries her own brother, a customary practice in Egypt but scandalous to the Greeks. The suffix Philadelphoi, brother-loving, consequently is added to the names of King Ptolemy II and Queen Arsinoe II. The former Queen Arsinoe I is banished to Koptos, a city of Upper Egypt near the Wadi Hamat, while her rival adopts her children. So that's a lot to unpack. So Ptolemy is Greek, Right, he's one of the Greek generals from the successor kingdom of Alexander's giant kingdom. And he takes over Egypt and makes himself pharaoh. And he becomes kind of Greco-Egyptian. And I guess that's why he marries his sister, or his sister marries him, I'm not sure. But Philadelphia is where you get the city of Philadelphia from, right? That's the city of brotherly love. Well, Philadelphia comes from Philadelphia. Now, Arsinoe II is banished to Upper Egypt. Upper Egypt is actually not on the Mediterranean coast. It's further inland. So the Nile flows, quote-unquote, in the wrong direction, right? It flows into the Mediterranean. So Upper Egypt is actually further into Africa. The first of the Syrian wars starts between Egypt's Ptolemy II and the Seleucid Emperor Antiochus I Soter, Soter meaning savior, the Egyptians invade northern Syria, but Antiochus defeats and repels his opponent's army. Ptolemy II sends an expedition to Ethiopia. So Ptolemy and the Egyptians are busy. Closer to home in Sicily, Pyrrhus negotiates with the Carthaginians to end the fighting between them in Sicily. The Carthaginians are inclined to come to terms with Pyrrhus, but he demands that Carthage abandon all of Sicily and make the Libyan Sea the boundary between Carthage and the Greeks. Meanwhile, he begins to display despotic behavior towards the Sicilian Greeks, and soon Sicilian opinion moves against him. Therefore, fearing that his successes in Italy, Italy, Sicily, may lead him to become the despot of their country, the Syracusans ask Pyrrhus to leave Sicily. He does so and returns to the Italian mainland, noting that he expects Sicily to be a fair wrestling ring for Carthage and Rome. You know, Pyrrhus does get a bad rap. We do name an entire Pyrrhic victory after him, but I think he was a good general. He could see things coming. He just, he wasn't really in a position of power. Maybe if he did the smart thing, which is bend the knee to Rome, and then get incorporated into Rome, he would have been more successful, but he decided to fight Rome, so I'm shrugging. Put my hands up, right? This is what happens when you fight Rome. In the Roman Republic, the Romans attack the Samnites and the Lucanians, the triumph of Brutus over the Lucanians and the Brutii. So it was last turn that Brutus, or last turn last year, when he was consul, Brutus 
took over the Lucanians and Brutii, right? That was Croton. And then I guess we're attacking the Samnites and Lucanians back for the revenge at the defeat of the Granita Hill last turn. And that's it. That covered our event messages. And uh, I think we're ready to roll into the next turn. So farewell, winter of 276 BCE. Let's go. I was thinking, I don't, I don't like that. I don't like that. Eating soup rays. Oh, my front door. I don't like it. Focusing on Carthage only works if my northern border is secure. My northern border is not secure, and I can't devote the full force of Rome's armies to the Carthaginian menace. But, taking out the Insubres is not something I planned for. Well, that's not good either. Alright, so, got a lot happening again. Welcome to turn 10, spring of 276 BCE. We have rampant piracy. Pirates are a serious problem requiring your immediate attention. How would you like to deal with these sea vermin? Hunted. Pirate hunting. The only good pirate is a dead pirate. Minus 25% piracy penalties in this local sea region. Recruited. Call of the sea. A trireme and a star to steer her by. Plus two fleet recruitment capacity or ignored. Rampant piracy. What's yours is there. Plus 25% piracy penalties in the local sea region. So we're obviously going to go with hunted. That's a minus 25% modifier for four turns. And we are going to gain 65 denarii out of it. So nothing crazy. Decimus Claudius Nepos and Marcus Cacilius Scores have gained a level, so that will also help us out in the short run. I'm going to go ahead and move Ulpius Severa down to... She doesn't want to move that way. We're going to go to the as far as she can go this way. We're going to go right towards what I think is going to be Pella. Yeah, there's Pella and the... Antonid, or the Antigonite. I don't want to do anything to the city. I just want to go around it. Which apparently she doesn't want to do, so that used up a lot of my movement, sadly. We'll put her as close to the city as possible and have her establish a intelligence network. Let's see, we have a couple war declares. The Basilion Odrasun. I've declared war on the Scordisi. So Basilian Odris on is starting to become a menace. And then the Thinny have de de yeah, destroyed, declared war on the Tosta Bogai. So I think that's the Thinny's first war. Yeah, so that's their first declaration of war, and the Tosta Bogai are now at war with three people. So they're probably going to get smashed here soon, the Tosta Bogai. And the Scordisi are at war with four people, so they're definitely going to get smashed here in a little bit. Household expands. Decimus Claudius Nepos, the governor, got a guard dog. He does not need it. So we're going to just have him get rid of it for now. Well, I guess technically I could have given him a guard dog. Yeah, we'll have to give them guard dogs next turn. I just took one away. So we're going to give a guard dog to Marcus Cacilius Scorus. Then we'll give Decimus Claudius Nepos his guard dog back next turn. Magna Gratia is having a late spring. So more poor fortunes. Quartermaster report. We have recruited the three Principes into Legion 2. That's your command. We are now going to march north with Legion 2. It is currently 12 units strong, and put it right on the border of Aretium and Genua. See if we can't get some line of sight, which we cannot. Also, the armies from Patavium seem to have disappeared. So I can only assume, right, this is where not having my spy nearby is not helping me, that 
the Venetian have invaded the Insubres and that they have had to go north to the city of Medhalan, which makes me really want to go towards Genoa if it's unmanned right now. I cannot see that far though. So I think I'm actually going to recruit from the area of Aretium. It does have some patricians and plebs. So we're going to go ahead and recruit something. I just don't know what yet. Edict issued. Commercial stimulation in Latium. And a faction joins the war. So Sparta has declared war on Lydia. What to do, what to do. I guess while we think we can go over our governors real quick. So if you recall last time, we went administrator than bureaucrat. We are now going to have them diverge a little bit. So we're going to have Marcus Caecilius Scorus head to economist. A devious and clever man can always improve commerce. Plus one cunning and plus 5% chance of evading enemy agents. And then he is going to go into industrialist. Now, you might be thinking, why is he going to go into industrialist? I don't use industry. Well, in order to get to export specialist, we have to have industrialist. So this isn't like the general's tree. Instead of getting the first level and then being able to span out into four areas, you have to go first level, second level, third level. So an industrialist. Production and employment are the backbone of society. Minus 5% industry building construction costs in the local province and plus 5% wealth from industry in the local province. And then because he got to level 3, he's actually going to get three abilities to choose from instead of just two. We can't go to export specialist just yet. We will need a rank of four. We are only rank three. So we are going to go over to public orator. The power of the spoken word knows no equal. Plus one zeal and plus 5% chance of evading enemy agents. And that will give us three authority, four cunning, and three zeal. So we will be in good shape there. We'll head on down to Decimus Claudius Nepos. He does something very similar, but we are going to give him a guard dog. So I did give him a guard dog. We are also going to go with economist, right? But instead of going into industrialist and export specialist, we're going to go into agriculturist and farming expert. So, agriculturist. The common farmer is the moral foundation for our culture. Minus 5% agriculture building construction costs in the local province, and plus 5% wealth from agriculture in the local province. This will help because... Early on, Magna Gratia is our farming province. And then we are also going to go public orator. And that handles our governors as they continue to administrate in the empire. Or the republic. I guess we're still a little bit early on. I want to build a building, but I only have 5,400 and nine denarii or no i only have five thousand eight hundred and six denarii to do so and next turn i'm supposed to be making five thousand four hundred and nine so you can see here because i'm not completing buildings but i've recruited a bunch of people i'm hurting i'm definitely hurting and any building i build now it's going to be too expensive Especially because I have to recruit. Alright, we're going to recruit. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we have the nine Prinkapes. We're going to get up to full strength of the eleven Prinkapes. And then we're going to have to recruit our more expensive units. We'll go with one Triarii and one Equites. Oh that leaves us with only 1,200 Denarii. That is not good. We won't even be able to build a building this turn. I don't like it. I do not like it. Have I mentioned that I don't like it? Oh, I have? Okay, just making sure. Hmm. I'm gonna take a gamble. We're risking it. We're gonna risk that I'm going to actually attack the city of Genoa next turn. 
Let's see if we can't look at our diplomacy tab and see. The Insubres are still about half our strength. The Venetians are not doing well. The Venetians are very bloodied right now. Not having line of sight is bad. Definitely a complication, friend. Definitely a complication. Ligurians are still off the coast here, just hanging out. I could declare war on the Ligurians. That would help me gain some favor with my Massalia, but then the Venetians would hate me, so we're not going to do that. I think that's it. we got to be careful, though, because it is turn 10. Something I haven't touched upon yet is this faction tab. So you can see it's on records right now. It shows you the records of everything. Then there's characters, politics, and summary. I haven't touched upon any of this yet. We're not going to just yet. But, the biggest thing here is we need to avoid civil war. And right now we are protected. Currently protected against secession slash civil war. The reason is the campaign started recently and we have 11 turns remaining. However, we have to get all of our parties into the positive. And right now, the Gens Cornelia is minus 20. The Gens Papiria is minus 26. And the Gens Junia is minus 4. little troublesome so we're gonna deal with that disaster later for now we're gonna just focus on our northern border and continuing to build up our economy so with that I'm gonna go ahead and end the turn farewell spring of 276 BCE let us see what summer has in store See if we can't maintain our money too. It's just uh, losing so much money by recruiting an army this early. We've dumped probably 10, 12,000 denarii into the army, which could have went into buildings. So this is not what I wanted. I did not want economic growth, or I did want economic growth, not military problems. I guess in the short term it hurts. In the long term, if we can take Genoa, it'll be a success, but it is a dicey proposition to march on Genoa with absolutely no vision. Now, if Medhalan fell to the Venetians, I would be happy, but it did not. So, welcome to summer. This is turn 11, summer of 276 BCE. OPS Sevra has been exposed, but we got lucky. The Ludi Plebei. After Rome threw off the rule of the Etruscan kings in 510 BCE to found the Republic, politics was the domain of the arist aristocratic patrician order, who remained distinct from the main body of the free Roman citizens or plebeians. It wasn't until the conflict of the orders resolved in 287 BCE that the plebs earned political representation and in many other matters equal standing with the patricians. As an assertion of pride and identity, the Ludi Plebei, or the Plebeian Games, were organized and hosted by the Plebeian Aediles, the Office of Public Maintenance, Order, and Festivals. Held annually from November 13th to the 17th at the Circus Flaminius, the festival involved the great feast to honor Jupiter Optimus Maximus, followed by days of theatrical performances, sporting competitions, and equestrian displays. So for four turns, we have the Ludi Plebei, we, the common people of Rome, have earned the right of celebration. Plus 20% wealth from culture, all regions, and plus 4 public order per turn, all regions. That is a very welcome gift. I'm going to go ahead and move our spy for this turn. I'm going to have her head down into Thessalonica. She might get some eyes on coin and tone eight alone, which I think is down here. Yeah, there it is. So we have the city of Larissa. We still have Athens and its two giant armies. 
right there. There's a lot down here. So Athens has two giant armies. Apyros has two giant armies on the shores of Apollonia. Which means Terrace is open for the taking, but we don't have an army down there to even take it. The Mountain Men, an army led by Sapos of the Venetii, has returned to Patavia with only 11 men, bloodied and battered, I assume. If you check the diplomacy screen, the Venetii have gotten even weaker, while the Insubres remain about the same. So what do we do here? Well, we continue trudging forward. We'll handle our event messages real quick. A faction rises. The Greasy. Construction is complete. So we did complete the Roman village of Wine. Faction destroyed. Liguria. So this faction has been destroyed. The people scatter to the winds. So Liguria finally met their end. Household expands. Decimus Claudius Nepos has got a pet snake. He does not need one. Then Quartermaster report. The two Principes, the Triarii, and the Equites. Legio 2 also now... Is not at full strength, but it's at enough strength that I think we can make some moves. We are going to go over our households real quick, though. So we're going to change his household, his first one, to a carrier pigeon. So if you remember carrier pigeons, fly my pretty. That gives us one authority, which is important. We want a commander with high authority, but it also gives us plus four line of sight. And that will take one turn to come through. And then he currently has a shield bearer, which we're going to keep him with, plus 4% armor for all units. We like our armor. I'm also going to check on our other generals. We're just going to have them get rid of their households for now, right? Those kind of retainer type units or objects, so we know what we have that we can give to our other generals. So we got a couple Corona Gremini, an Executioner, a Master of the Horse, and then a couple Professional Hecklers. Ready for battle. I think we're going to give our professional hecklers to... Yeah, we're going to give one to Lucius Papyrus Cursor. We're going to give Ready the two crowns battle. to... One to Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio Asina. And we're going to give battle. one to Decimus Junius Brutus. And we're going to hold off for now. So this is where... I reached a point of no return. So remember Caesar's, what is it, Alea, Iacta, Est, the die is cast. Well, this is what we're doing. We are now casting the die. We're going to move, we're going to see here, 1650. Ready for battle. Yeah, we're going to move Commander. Legion 4 up to Aretium, just outside of the city of Aretium to the north. Ready for orders. Your next Actually, no, we're going to leave him in the city of Aretium. We are now going That's to cross command. into Insubre's territory. So, ready, we're about to get a warning that we've incurred a diplomatic penalty. There it is. Trespassing. Your troops have entered another land, lands without a military access pact. If they linger and you don't gain such a pact, you may incur this faction's wrath. We also have fortunately discovered a Venetian army. So, the Venetians have two armies. They have the Mountain Men, led by Sepios, with 11 units. And they have the Tumult, Tumult led by Catuvolcus. He's just a general, or Sepios is their king. So, it looks like the Mountain Men, 16 men, were traveling through the mountain pass from Patavium to Genoa to take on the Heralds of Death. That is the army led by the king of the Insubres. So I think what we do now is we, we just attack battle. the city of Genoa. We declare war on the Insubres and we pray. The Insubres currently have no defensive allies and no military allies and they're at war with the Venetians. So this will make the Venetians extremely happy. The Venetians are, however, at war with the Reishi and the Insubres. Now, I could always let this Venetian army attack 
that Insubrain army and let them deal some damage first. I think actually that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to declare war. I'm going to move out of the way over here. So I'm going to move a little bit closer to the city. And then I'm going to actually go into what's called a raiding stance. I can't go into a raiding stance. Why can't I go into a raiding stance? I should be able to. Ambush, fortify, patrol region. I don't know why I can't go into a raiding stance. That is mysterious. No, I'm not so sure what I want to do. I wanted to go into a raiding stance. I have to get closer to the city to get some intel. See, I still can't get any intel on this city. So the city has like no garrison, which is nice. The garrison's at about half strength if I attack now. And there's 15 units in the city that are regulars. We keep moving my army a little bit closer, a little bit closer. Okay, so that is damage. We're gonna move this as close as possible without declaring war. All right, so we are gonna do it. It'll probably be next turn that we're gonna do this battle. Wow, we are up over an hour. I didn't even notice that. So yeah, it's gonna be next turn. But next turn, next turn, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it next turn. All right, that's it for now. We've eclipsed that hour mark that I usually go for, and uh, yeah. You know what? We're gonna, we're gonna just do it now. We're gonna leave off right here. It's going to diplomacy. It's going to the insubrates, right? I don't want to spend the entire day to think I'm about sure it. I'm sure you have many pleasantries for me, but please. Our young warriors crave their chance to earn their rights as men. Your blood will wash away their youth. You hear that? Their young warriors will wash away. My blood will wash away their youth. None will escape. So there you have it. Lucius Julius Liable of Rome, with 2,900 men, is attacking Duneos, the king of the Insubres. He has 2,222 men, with 830 reinforcing, which brings him to about 3,000. So this should be a very easy fight. It even has me winning if I auto-resolved it. It's a Pyrrhic victory, but... We're gonna go ahead and encircle it for we now. Take this for and then we're gonna save the game right here and be done. That's it. I will see you next time for what I'm thinking is the Battle of Genoa. As always, thanks for tuning in. Have a good one, and I'll see you later. Thanks. <laughs>